Well, good evening and welcome to Wednesday in the Word. My name is Dr. Jeff Gaskins, and uh, we have been studying together on Wednesday uh, through the book of 1 Kings into 2 Kings in a series of messages on Elijah and Elisha, the prophets of fire. We've been focusing especially on Elijah for the last few weeks, and we're continuing tonight. And if you will take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19 is where our Bible reading tonight will be, 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah was a prophet during the reign of King Ahab and Jezebel, both wicked queen and king combination, who have led the children of Israel into extreme idolatry with the, uh, with the uh, uh, idols of, and the false gods of Baal. And, and we've seen in 1 Kings chapter 18, been a confrontation between the prophets of Baal and with Elijah up on Mount Carmel and uh, the rumble on the mountain. And uh, God has rained down fire and has consumed the sacrifice. And the people have seen that God uh, of heaven is the real God and the gods of Baal are not. And so it's from this scene going from the top of the mountain where Elijah comes off of the mountain and Ahab is going back to Jezebel uh, to tell her about what has happened, that his prophets of Baal had been defeated, uh, they have been killed, and uh, there's a mess there. So uh, that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 19, and then we're going to read the first uh, 10 verses. It's going to be quite a contrast between what happened on Mount Carmel and what is happening to Elijah here. Let's read the Bible together. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. And he rose and he ran for his life and he came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah and left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, and take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. <coughs> and he ate and he drank. And he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave, and he lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at a subject that is very familiar to, to many of us tonight, and we're going to be looking at the subject of discouragement that can lead into even bouts of depression. And uh, tonight we're looking at Elijah, who is a depressed prophet. And this is going to be a two-part message. We're going to be looking more at the uh, cause and consequences of what's happened to Elijah. And we'll be concentrating more next week upon uh, what God's cure for Elijah the prophet is. But here's a key truth I want us to, to focus on tonight. Even the strongest people, are subject to discouragement, depression, and failure. Even the strongest people are subject to discouragement, depression, and failure. Someone has said that depression is the common cold of the emotions. And I know that uh, during this COVID-19 epidemic, not everybody's had COVID-19, but there's a, probably a lot more people who have suffered from depression because of the lockdowns and all the things and the disruption and all the things that have happened here who have been depressed. Let me just share this. It's a false idea to believe that God's people are immune to depression. Sometimes we think, well, we're supposed to praise the Lord and thank the Lord and, you know, pray and, and worship. And so, you know, we should be joyful people all the time and that uh, depression should not be something that should be happening in the lives of God's people. Uh, but it does. 
And unfortunately, there's not a vaccine to prevent it. Uh, it can come. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, the great reformer, uh, was suffering from a severe devout depression. His wife, Catherine, dressed all in black. He looked at her and said, well, who died? And she replied, well, because of the way you're acting, I thought God had died. Samuel Logan Bringle, a um, great uh, theologian, preacher, gospel of days gone by, uh, wrote this about his own self. He said, such doom and depression fell upon me as I had never known. God seemed non-existent. The grave seemed by, endle the grave seemed by endless gold. Life lost all of its glory, charm, and meaning. Prayer brought to me no relief. Indeed, I seem to have lost the spirit of prayer and the power to pray. Men such as Charles Spurgeon, Samuel Logan Bringle, Martin Luther, uh, some of the great men of the past, great preachers, great reformers, uh, great men of God, suffered terribly uh, with depression. Charles Spurgeon uh, would often have to leave London and go uh, into Europe where he would uh, be by himself for uh, months at a time to be able to just get himself out of fits of melancholy. Uh, what is depression? And let's just give a definition of it. It is a state of gloom, sadness, dejection, and lowered spirits. It can be temporary, a short period of melancholy, or it can be long-lasting, uh, which has more of a neurotic thing to it in which it can be lifelong or even can over long periods of time and can be severe in what we would call clinical depression. What are some of the symptoms of it? A person is suffering from depression. These are some, many times multiple symptoms occur in the person's life. It's a sense of helplessness, feelings of worthlessness, loss of self-esteem, pessimism about the future, intense sadness, loss of interest in ordinary things, tendency to withdraw from activities and relationships, a downcast expression, a slump in posture, feelings that daily routine are mountainous, Food tastes peculiar. There's a loss of appetite, loss of sleep, poor concentration, sluggish speech, lessened sex drive, aches and pains, thoughts of wanting to die, and uncontrollable tears. Many people suffer from bouts of melancholy, from depression, from severe discouragement, and experience many of these. And the prophet that we're going to see tonight, Elijah, great man of God, filled with the power of God, and yet he is a classic study in a man who was depressed. Here's some things to know, and just I'm going to give you five of these real quickly as kind of set the stage of what we're going to look tonight at uh, Elijah. Some things to know. Making a depressed person feel guilty for feeling depressed only make it worse. In other words, depression occurs to many of us, uh, and... It's not something where you just, you know, tell somebody, snap out of it, and, you know, don't be depressed. Uh, that just simply makes it worse. Our emotions cannot be changed by the demand, don't be depressed. In other words, you can't just simply say to yourself, don't be depressed. Uh, that's not a workable solution, and we're going to see some of the things that God does in the life of Elijah. Christians can be depressed. Believers can be. Depression is not necessarily a sign of spiritual failure. Doesn't mean that we're, you know, just way off the base spiritually with God. It can come in the times when we're close to the Lord. Not all answers to depression are spiritual ones. Sometimes they're physical. Sometimes our, our body and our soul are so intertwined that uh, I think C.S. Lewis said that our bodies and soul are so intertwined that the body and soul can catch each other's diseases. And so the body being sick can bring even depression to the spirit. Uh, Here's some things I want us to look at tonight. We're going to look at the context for Elijah's depression, the causes for his depression, and then we're going to look at some of the consequences. Next week, we'll look at the cure, and uh, we'll look at uh, more of that uh, next week. First of all, there's the context for Elijah's depression. Two things I want you to see here at the very beginning of, our, of chapter 19. And his depression, in which he is fearful on the run from Jezebel, in a cave wanting to die. I mean, this is where he is at. He has gone from the mountaintop all the way down to the valley in a very short amount of time. And he has had a prior great victory. He's had an emotional high. He has prayed 
public demonstration of the power of God. God has, uh, he's prayed and rain has come. I mean, he's, you know, people are turning to the Lord. Israel's turning back to the Lord and turning away from their idols. Uh, you know, Ahab is on the run. Uh, he is, he's thinking of seeing great victory. And so he is experiencing a spiritual high. There's a principle here. After great spiritual highs, there is a great temptation to experience immediately after that spiritual lows. In other words, there's only when your emotions and your the victory, when, when it's up here, there's only one way for it to go, and that's to go down. And oftentimes it doesn't come back to normal. It will go past that and can keep right on sliding and right down into the valley. And that is an important principle to understand and to, to check ourselves and when there are times of great spiritual victory that can be followed by uh, the enemy coming in and wanting to depress us and, and to take away from that victory where the Lord has done. So the right time, the time after a great victory is a prime time for feelings of depression. Great highs can lead to great lows. So there's the prior victory on Mount Carmel. His emotions are running a roller coaster here, and he's on the roller coaster. Um, and then there is the threats of Queen Jezebel. I want you to notice this, that uh, Elijah has confronted the prophets of Baal, and he has had her prophets of Baal killed. They've been executed. Now, why didn't Jezebel just go after Elijah and just send somebody to come kill him, just get rid of him? I want you to notice what she does. She sends a messenger to Elijah. Um, she's a shrewd lady, and uh, she's, she's understanding, I don't have to, to get rid of him. I don't, just, I don't have to kill him. So she sends a messenger, and you say to him, I'm going to kill you. And she was correct in her assessment that she didn't necessarily, she didn't have to kill him. All she had to do was say she was going to, and her threat worked like a charm. Uh, her instincts were good on this. She knew she could come after him. And what happened to him? Verse 3, Elijah, then he was afraid. Here's a man who's just seen fire come down from God. He's just slaughtered 450 prophets of Baal. And now this woman sends a threat, not even an assassin. She just sends a message saying, I'm going to do this. And it sends him off the cliff. He is afraid. And he goes from great victory, seeing the power of God, to now trembling before the very just words out of the mouth of this woman. And then he goes and, uh, and he asked, verse 4, he asked that he might die. He's like, well, she's already threatened to kill me, so God, just go ahead and take me out of here. Just, just get, get rid, you know, just take me out. Interesting that this is the first time in the life of Elijah, and he's known as a great man of prayer, where God didn't answer his prayer. Why? Because he was not praying in the will of God, obviously. He asked to die, and God said, no, you're not going to die. This is, you know, Je Jezebel's not going to kill you, and I'm not going to take your life, and no, you're not going to die. Interesting, we're going to find out later on in the life of Elijah, that Elijah never dies. God never answers this prayer of his. Elijah is going to be taken alive directly from earth to heaven in a chariot of fire. And so physically, Elijah never died on this earth. So the Lord did not answer and has not answered this uh, request of Elijah that he might die. So you've got the context, great victory, the threat from Jezebel, and it just sends uh, Elijah into a tailspin. He's heading down. He's running off, getting into a cave, wanting to die. I'm the only one that's left. Classic case of depression, discouragement, being down. Well, I'm just I'm going to look at secondly, and we're going to look in the life of Elijah, some of the causes of what got him in that cave and what got him to the place of even wanting to die and being so discouraged and afraid is that I want us to look at some of the causes in Elijah's life. And some of these we may be identify as some of the things that happen in our life that may lead to depression and discouragement in our life. Uh, but I do want to preface it with this. I want you to understand, depression is complicated and multifaceted and should not be seen simplistically. 
And what I mean by that is to say, okay, well, this, 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 and just the very simple answers, and this is causes depression. Depression can have multiple causes. Uh, it can be uh, spiritual. It can be physical. There can be physical things that happen to us that affect our spirits. Um, and that may need a medical answer to it. Uh, it can be genetic in which it, uh, it runs in a family and it may be uh, something where people in our family, where we're just, uh, the psyche and the way that we are made up just makes us more susceptible uh, to depression than even other people. Some people have uh, more of a jolly kind of a disposition and spirit. They don't, they don't, they don't have real highs and lows. They're just kind of uh, melancholy uh, along, you know, along the way, kind of even keel, where other people have highs and lows and may be more susceptible. So there's a lot of things that go into this. Our, our background, our genetics, where we are, our relationship with the Lord, our, our physical being, our spiritual well-being, our mental state, what's happening around us, circumstances. So there, it's multifaceted. So let's don't you know, have just simplistic answers and, well, this causes it, this causes it. What we're doing here is just kind of assessing Elijah's case, and I think there's some things that we can learn here. So what are some of the things that uh, the Bible seems to bring out that led to uh, Elijah's depression? Well, first of all, it tells us right off in, in, uh, that he was afraid, verse 3. Elijah was scared. Elijah had been told by God on numerous occasions to go some places. God told him to go to the brook Kirith, and he went there and he was fed by the ravens and got water there. He was told to go to the widow at Zarephath, and he went there and God provided for him there. Chapter 18, verse 1, he was told to go see King Ahab. You go tell him that the rain is coming. And that, <coughs> excuse me, that's when the uh, setup for going to Mount Carmel came there when he met. Uh, so God's been telling Elijah where to go, where to go, where to go. But don't you notice this, that when Jezebel threatens him and he gets scared, he doesn't wait for the Lord to tell him, okay, now, now here's where I want you to go. I want you to go here. I know Jezebel's threat is coming at you. I protected you before. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> here's what I want to do for you. He didn't do that. He receives no word from the Lord, doesn't ask the Lord. He just gets scared, gets afraid, and he runs. Mike Tyson, the, the boxer, in fact, he just had a, a bout not too long ago, but Mike Tyson said this, and he said, everyone has a plan until someone hits you in the mouth. Well, <laughs> Elijah had a plan about doing this and going here and there, but you know he's been threatened by Jezebel, and I guess he's been, uh, you could say, hit in the mouth, and he, he doesn't have a plan. He's just, I'm, I'm just running. I'm not going to wait for the Lord to tell me what to do. I'm just going to run for my life. I'm going to head for the wilderness. I'm going to head for the hills. I'm going to head them to the mountains. And I'll do what I think I need to do to be able to preserve myself. Classic case of fear. And fear's put him on the run. And now fear is controlling his emotions. And when our emotions get in control, our brain gets kicked out of gear and it's not working. And our spiritual radar and things begin to not work. And we're not... When motions control, we're not thinking clearly and we're not looking at truth clearly and that's what's happened to him. He's afraid. He's fearful. Fear, I mean, his life is threatened. I mean, we would, someone come to us and said, I'm going to kill you. I mean, it would be a natural reaction to have fear. But this fear has taken him over, led him out, and it's just started the, the downward spiral of his depression. Secondly, not only was Elijah afraid. He was, he was uh, scared. Secondly, Elijah was frustrated. You see, he had fear in his head, and now he has failure and frustration in his heart. Why is he frustrated? Well, think about this. He's been up on the mountain. He's seen the fire of God come down. People have turned to the Lord. Ahab has run, and he's run to Jezebel. Maybe he thought that Jezebel was just going to give up and quit and say, Oh, I cry, Uncle, you killed my prophets. You know, I'll, I'll give up the throne. And, you know, God is God. And no, that's not what she does. <coughs> she says, I'm going to kill him. She doesn't give up. And Elijah's thinking this great victory. And now this woman, she's going to kill me. And, you know, why didn't she, you know, capitulate? You see, he expected revival complete 
didn't happen. You see, now, had he seen a great victory? Was Israel turning back to the Lord? Was Ahab on the run? Yeah, all of those things were true. God had done a great victory there. So the truth in front of him is that God was doing a great work. But because Jezebel didn't capitulate, he sees it as failure. Let me, see, let me tell you this. Failure is real to the person who feels it. It may not be real. And if you look at it and assess it from the outside, we go, well, no, that's not failure. I mean, that's great victory, Elijah. Look at me. Look what's happened. But he feels like it's failure. And when he feels like it's failure, as far as he is concerned, it's failure. And so that failure gets into frustration. Lucy said to, to Charlie Brown, she said, Charlie Brown, you are a call third strike. You're a 7-10 split in the 10th frame. You're a missed putt on the 18th green. You're a foul ball. You're a shanked nine iron. You're a miscue in a game of pool. You are playing in the shadow of your own goalpost. You know what Lucy would say? Charlie Brown, you're just a failure. Whatever you do. Now, is it true? You know, No, but that's what she's saying to him. And when you feel like a failure, then that's what you think you are. Failure gives you a distorted perspective and causes us to lose our purpose and causes us to think that everything is bad. So, what does he do? Elijah goes to, he leaves, he goes to Jezreel. That's where the, summer, that's where the palace of Ahab is. He leaves from there and he goes to, to Beersheba. Then he goes on to, to Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb is another 240 miles out in the wilderness. Mount Horeb is where there's Mount Sinai. That's where God met with Moses up on the mountain to give him the Ten Commandments. And so he goes back, he goes, goes down into the wilderness to Mount Horeb, and he goes into a cave, and when he gets into this cave, God comes to him in this cave and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? What, what are you doing here in this cave? Do you know what this cave was? This cave on Mount Sinai, in, down in the wilderness at Mount Horeb. This cave was the very place where God met with Moses to give him the Ten Commandments. Very same mountain, very same cave. And so Elijah has gone back. What's the foundation for the nation of Israel? It's the Ten Commandments. It's the law. God entering into a law covenant with His people. I mean, the very foundation of all of His, his nation goes back to that very spot when God met with Moses. So what he's doing, he's going back to the very beginning and he's in that cave and what basically what he's saying is that everything's done. The nation of Israel is finished. God, everything that you started with us, Ten Commandments, nation of Israel, covenant with us, it is done. And I'm the only one who's left of all of the people of Israel in other words, he sees it as an absolute, total failure that everything is wrong and everything is done and this is it. And let's just die and just go on because there's nothing else to go from there. You know, there's going to be some times in your life when you're going to be absolutely disappointed with people. They're not going to, they're not going to come over to your side. They're not going to agree with you. They're not going to see it your way. They're going to stand in the way. In other words, they're going to oppose you. And they're going to come after you. And you're wanting to do things for God. It's not like that you want to do something terrible. You want to do some things for God. And they're standing in the way of it and sabotaging it and coming in and causing wreaking havoc in what you're trying to do for the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you what, that frustration and that fear of failure and that fear of you not being able to, to move forward and that everybody's against me and no one is with me, I'm telling you, you can work on your spirit and cause and, and depression can creep in. So Elijah was scared. Elijah was frustrated. Elijah was drained, drained physically. You know, when he came down, when he came down off Mount Carmel, he went to Jezreel. Remember how he ran there? That's about 15 miles. So he ran to Jezreel. Well, after he gets to Jezreel, he goes to Beersheba. Beersheba is another 90 miles. 
Then after he leaves Beersheba, he goes 240 miles to Horeb. This guy's tired. I mean, he, he, he's not taking a bus. He's not taking a plane or a train. He's walking all of this, running part of it. And so, and this is, this is not easy journey here. There's no, uh, you know, a paved roads or those or walking paths or whatever. It's mountain. It's rugged. It's, he's out there. He's tired. Just simply tired. Fatigue and extended illnesses that drain our physical bodies can lead to depression. Just getting tired, being overtaxed, doing so much. Vince Lombardi, the great football coach, says, he said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. He said, when football players get tired, they don't want to hit. They get tired. They, they shrink back and they don't want to be able to just you know, go forward. And he said, fatigue makes cowards. And that's what's happened to him. He's just tired. He doesn't have any strength or physical energy to be able to do. Uh, and oftentimes, we just need to understand that the pace of life often leads to fatigue. We go, 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 and we just crash and burn because we're not meant. God didn't design these bodies of ours to go 24-7, 365. God has designed these bodies of ours, and God has even designed the weak to be able to give a day of rest so that we can recharge and re-energize and be able to go forward. You go without rest. Uh, you're, you're setting yourself up possibly for uh, leading into depression. Number four reason, Elijah was isolated. It says down in verse four, he went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down in the... And look at verse three, he says, no, which he says he, he belongs to Judah and he left his servant there at Beersheba. Then he goes a day's journey. So at this point, when he heads into the wilderness and then when he goes on to Mount Horeb, when he goes to Horeb and he goes to Mount Sinai, he's by himself. He's left his servant behind. He has no one else with him. It's just Elijah by himself. Let me share something with you. Isolation is a breeding ground for depression. Discouraged people are most often lonely people. We all need people in our life to encourage us, to pray for us, that when they see us down, to be able to lift us up and to lift our spirits. And when we don't have those and we separate ourselves and we... And listen, that's a tendency. And I, I, I have that very same tendency. It's one of the, you know, it's a temptation that, you know, I like to withdraw, to get away, get away from people, get away from all the things. Um, what was it? I was reading this week about Mark Driscoll talked about having a, uh, he said, uh, he's, a, he's a pastor, and uh, he says that sometimes pastors have what he calls bread truck Mondays. And I thought, well, what is a bread truck Monday? He said a bread truck Monday is when a pastor is tired, frustrated, things are not going well, wants to quit, doesn't want to keep going on, depressed, discouraged, frustrated about everything that this idea comes that I'll just quit this pastoring stuff and I'll just drive a bread truck. Think about it. What does a guy do when he drives a bread truck? He goes and he picks up bread and he delivers it. Along the way, he can listen to the radio. He doesn't have to fix people's problems. He didn't have to talk about people's problems. All he's doing is delivering bread from A to B. Then when he's done, he goes home and the next day he does it again. And he, I, I know that feeling sometimes of saying, listen, I just like to, to get away from it, get away from people, get away from problems, get away from difficulties, get away from the frustrations and the failures and all the things that are happening. And I just like to have a nice, simple, isolated, driving a bread truck by myself, listening to the radio with no responsibilities other than delivering bread from A to B. He's isolated, no friends, no one around him. And he's, it's created paralysis in his life. He's in a cave, he can't do anything. Isolated from people, fearful, frustrated. And then lastly, Elijah was deceived. He believed in his mind some things that were not true. Well, what one of them, look at verse 10. He says, I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. 
Well, the first deception was is that I only am left and God's going to tell him, no, you're not. All, everything doesn't depend on you, Elijah. And that's what he's saying here. Everything depends on me. I'm the only one that's left. Nothing's going to go forward. Nothing's going to be done. If I don't do it, well, that's not true. Life goes on. God's going to do His work. And He'll do it with us or without us. But He's going to do His work. And it's not all dependent upon me. I'm not the only one that's you know, doing something for the Lord. It's just... Elijah, you're deceived. That's not right. Then he says, and they seek my life. Now, there's only one person that wants to kill him. It's Jezebel. And now he's saying they. Well, he's gone from one person wanting to kill him to a bunch of people wanting to kill him. Is that true? No, it's not true. The only person that's after him is Jezebel. The people of Israel are not. They're, they've turned to the Lord. I, you know, Elijah's their hero. The only person that wants to kill him is Jezebel. But he's now made this group up. They were like this conspiracy. These people out here, they're all against me. These people are against me. It's there. There, you know, this. What's he doing? He, his mind, he's being deceived. He is exaggerating the enemy. It's just one wicked woman. Listen, if God can rain down fire from heaven, don't you think God can take care of one loudmouth wicked woman? Absolutely. She's, but he is, he's gone from her to this group of people that are now after him. Deception. He's not, he, now he's into self-pity. Uh, they're seeking my life. You know, God, I'm the only one. I mean, and notice the, the self-talk, the, the talk to himself, what he's saying about himself, things that are wrong and leading to his depression. What were the consequences? What happened to him? Well, let me look at five of these quickly. Elijah lost his perspective. A short-term victory doesn't mean the war is over. For the believer, the battle never ends. Jezebels will not give up. We must depend on the Lord for victory every day. Do we really think that we're going to have complete, total victory, that every enemy is going to lie down and that you know, no one's ever going to oppose and no one's ever going to, you know, to come against us? No. That's not realistic. And he lost that perspective. He's had... Great victories. God's done some wonderful things. And Jezebel's not going to just go lay down and die. We're always going to have Jezebel. Always. I don't care what kind of victory you have on Mount Carmel. I don't care what God does in your life, in the life of your family, in the life of your ministry, in the life of your church. You're always, always, always going to have Jezebel's. They're going to keep at it. They're never going to give up. They're going to come after you. And what that does is that when God doesn't defeat all the Jezebels in our life, what He's doing is saying, depend upon me. You know, you don't, don't think that you have one shot, one big victory. You know, you've delivered the nuclear bomb and everything's, you know, everything's been cleared out. No, you got to depend upon me every day and the Jezebels are still there. And we'll continue to walk forward in victory. And I'll continue to take care of the Jezebels day by day. And when that one's taken care of, I'll take care of the next one for you. He lost his perspective. He lost his commitment to follow God's Word. He didn't allow God to direct his path after he came off Mount Carmel. Instead of listening to the Lord, okay, Lord, where do you want me to go? All right, Jezebel wants to kill me. Lord, where do you want me to go? No. Then listen for the Lord. He decided, I know where I want to go. I'm going to go on the run. So he lost his commitment to follow God's Word. He lost his vision of the greatness of God. What did he just see? Fire come down from heaven. Now he's on the run from a woman trying to kill him. I mean, you're talking about losing a vision. He's lost the vision of the victory of God of what God has done. If God can do this, then obviously he can take care of this. If God can take care of this big problem, then obviously he can take care of Jezebel. But he's lost that vision of what God has done and he's focused simply on the problem that's in front of him. And by focusing on the problem and looking down at the problem, he's forgotten to look up on the mountain at what God has done. And I think this is one of the big consequences that happens in depression in the lives of God's people and it happened to Elijah. And I think it's one of the things that, I think that the reason maybe the devil tries to work this into our life as much as he can, and this is that Elijah lost his fight. He's not fighting anymore. 
He's sitting in a cave wanting to die. He's not out praying. He's not out confronting the prophets of Baal. He's not out trying to lead God's people in a continued revival. He's not out confronting Jezebel, confronting Ahab with their sin. He's in a cave doing nothing. And I think that's one of the, to me, one of the devastating consequences of depression is that it takes good, godly people out of the fight. I, I, I like to watch war movies. And, they're, and you see them oftentimes, sometimes in war movies where uh, guys have been on the front lines and they've been fighting and fighting and fighting and, and they've seen a lot of their buddies die. And, and some, sometimes the point is just they just have this battle fatigue and it just comes over them and they just get paralyzed. And they've been a great warrior. I mean, they've been on the front lines and they, they know how to battle and they've been victorious and have done some great things in battle, but it just, they just, it just, cre- and they just, they quit. And this army or the, these soldiers just stop. And that happens, I think, too many of God's people. They just get discouraged and frustrated with with life. They get discouraged and frustrated with things that happen in the church that maybe they don't like or want to be changed or be this or that or whatever. I know it happens with pastors. I, I know I had to fight this all the time. We just get discouraged and we just we don't want to fight anymore. I, I'm, I'm tired. I, you know, I, I don't want to pick up the gun. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to pick up the sword. I, I'm, just, I'm just tired. I just want to sit here, drink a Pepsi, have a cracker, do nothing, you know, just don't want to get out there anymore. I'm tired of being shot at, I'm tired of being, you know, hurt. And a lot of God's people who need to be back in the battle, taken out because of this depression. And then Elijah, last lost his will to live. He came to a point where he said, I've had enough. And that tragically can happen where Severe depression can lead to even suicidal thoughts. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dangerous place to go deep down into the valley of depression because it can leap there where I begin to think, well, I'd be better off dead. And we get to that point of thinking I'd be better off dead. That's a dangerous place to be. And I, I, unfortunately, I've, in my ministry, I've seen people who have suffered from depression who have actually even taken that step of taking their life. Uh, and that's just what the devil would want to do, and you know, just take us out of the fight and just take us out of the way so that we're not there you know, working in the mission of God. Let me give you, uh, we'll bring to a close. I'm going to talk more next week about some of the things that God does specifically in the life of Elijah to, to get him out of that cave and to get him back into the fight. But let me just close with these two things and uh, just, just meditate on them. Two lessons, I think. God cared for Elijah even when he was disobedient. You notice there in this passage about how that God comes to Elijah in the cave and he says to him, what are you doing here? And he sent an angel to him. We're going to talk more about that next week who fed him and gave him some you know, bread and water and you know, and, and just helped him to get refreshed physically to get back, you know, get back his spirit, back his soul and strength or whatever. God, Elijah is out of the will of God, and yet God is loving and gracious. God doesn't deride him, and, you know, God does not, you know, beat him down on the head and, you know, get out of, you know, get out of your funk. What are you doing? You know, and you know, God is gracious to him. Love, that's our God. Look, God loves us. When we're in the slew of despond, depression. God loves us and cares about us and He hurts with us. He's there to, to minister His healing oil that can help to salve those wounds, not the wounds on the outside, but the wounds of the Spirit to be able to get us back into the, to back in the fight. And I want you to notice in verse 9 it says this, that when Elijah came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing? Notice the next word. This is God speaking to Elijah, to Elijah in the cave. What are you doing here? Notice that God did not say, What are you doing there? 
If God would have said, what are you doing there? It would have implied that Elijah's in the cave and that God's over here and that God's saying, well, what are you doing in that cave? But what God says to Elijah is that, Elijah, what are you doing here in the cave? And the implication is, is that God was in the cave. God had been there earlier with Moses. God never left. He says, Elijah, he says, he said, God says, my presence is right here with you. You're going to see next week when we get into that, talking about the presence of the Lord, how sweet it is, and how God just reveals himself in such a precious way to Elijah there. But what that tells us is that God will never leave or forsake me no matter how far I retreat into the cave of depression. Let me say that again. It's good. God will never leave or forsake me no matter how far I retreat into the cave of depression. And I just close with this. It tells you how much the God loves us. Romans chapter 8, 5 and verse 8 says, God shows His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When I was away from God, when I was rebellious against Him, when I was living and doing what I wanted to do. God loved me so much and would not leave me alone in my sin. And He sent His Son Jesus to die for me, to die in my place on the cross of Calvary so that I could be in a relationship with Him. And that same God who sent His Son to die for me that I could have my sins forgiven and be in relationship with Him is that very same God who stays with me day after day, never leaves me, never forsakes me, always with me, right there with me in the cave when I am sitting there depressed, sucking my thumb, saying I just want to die and get away from it all. That's a loving God that we have. And Elijah's experiencing that. And I pray that in your life, maybe, in some, maybe there's some tendencies toward depression that you have. Maybe because of this pandemic and all the stuff that's happened to us in this 2020, uh, that you're feeling depressed. I know we're even going to the Christmas holidays, and depression cranks up at Christmas. It does. Cranks up at holidays. And, it, and especially with this year with all that's going on, I, I just think that depression is just going to be pervasive uh, in our country, just to be a depressive spirit. And we're going to try to sing our way out of it, try to Christmas our way out of it, but uh, I think we need some biblical solutions. We need to have a God who's with us there in the cave, who comforts us, who leads us and who guides us and who takes care of us. And that, that's what I'm praying for, for you and me. Uh, so if you're suffering, maybe right now from depression. Listen, God loves you. God cares about you. And He's coming to you right where you are. And He's got the solutions for you. He's got the, he's got the things that you need to be able to get you out of that cave and to, to get you back out into the sunshine and back out into, back out into the battle, back out into the mission that God has called you to be and to do in your life. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, you take this message and, Lord, speak to our hearts. And, Lord, I pray that uh, we learn from Elijah's life and that, Lord, that uh, you comfort us and strengthen us and that, Lord, uh, that you would be able to, to lift us out uh, for those of us that are in those caves of depression to be able to comfort us and to lift us and to get us back out into the sunshine. And, uh, Lord, we just pray. for. I pray for maybe one person here tonight who's listening to this message who's really suffering from this. And Lord, I just pray for that person that you comfort them, strengthen them. Lord, may this message tonight be just something that speaks to their heart and says, God says, I understand, I love you, care about you, and I want to help you to get out of that. Lord, I pray that you speak to that person's heart tonight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, listen, thank you for joining us for Wednesday in the Word. Uh, we will next week be back and continue on 1 Kings chapter 19, and we'll get to that last C, the cure. We've looked at the content, context, and we looked at the causes and the consequences, and we'll be looking more in depth at the cure next week and what God did in the life of Elijah to be able to lead him out of that cave of depression. God bless you, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see you next week.